The Bureau of Industry and Security presents Re-Exports and Offshore Transactions. This video provides an introduction on how to determine if your re-export or offshore transaction is subject to the Export Administration Regulations. The introduction scene says, Re-Exports and Offshore Transactions, U.S. Department of Commerce Bureau of Industry and Security. The scene transitions to a map of the world. A text box appears that says re-export, an actual shipment or transmission of an item subject to the export administration regulations from one foreign country to another foreign country, including the sending or taking of an item to or from such countries in any manner. 15 CFR 734.14 1A a green arrow appears on the map pointing from Brazil to Europe, and an image of an integrated circuit labeled Made in the USA moves along the green arrow from Brazil to Europe. The scene transitions to a male character, Francois, sitting at his desk in France with a view of the Eiffel Tower from his window. He calls his Canadian supplier, and a female character named Elsa answers the call via her headset. Elsa is sitting at her desk in Canada with a view of the CN Tower from her window. Bonjour, madame. Je m'appelle François. I am calling to see if my field programmable gate array integrated circuit is ready to be shipped. Hello, François. My name is Elsa. Let me see. Unfortunately, your order has been placed on hold. It appears that we may need to apply for a license from the United States government before we ship. But you are shipping from Canada to me in Paris. Why would we need a license from the United States? A screen appears with a map of the world, and a blue text box appears that says, Shipping from Canada to France might require a U.S. export license? A green arrow appears on the map, pointing from Canada to France. Then a question mark appears in the center of the screen. That's a great question, Francois. This happens because some of our product comes from the United States and are subject to the Export Administration regulations. What we have here is called a re-export. When it comes to shipping an item that was manufactured in the United States or incorporates U.S. origin commodities or bundles with U.S. origin software, they may be U.S. authorization required to re-export that item from Canada to other countries. As Elsa is speaking, another green arrow appears on the map, pointing from the United States to Canada. A text box that says export appears pointing to the arrow from the United States to Canada. Another text box appears, re-export, pointing to the arrow from Canada to France. A blue text bubble appears that says your item might be subject to the export administration regulations, EAR, if. It was produced in the United States. It is a non-U.S. made product that contains more than a specified percentage of controlled U.S. origin content. It is a non-U.S. made product based on certain U.S. origin technology or software. Or it is a non-U.S. made product made by a plant or a major component of a plant that is the direct product of certain U.S. origin technology or software. This bubble appears multiple times throughout the video and will be referred to as the item subject to the EAR bubble. Ah, merci Elsa. So if my field programmable gate array integrated circuit is of US origin, then you might need a US re-export license to ship the integrated circuit to me? As Francois is speaking, an integrated circuit that says made in the USA appears on the screen above Canada and a red arrow points to the phrase, it was produced in the United States, on the blue text bubble. The scene transitions back to a side-by-side -side view of Francois in France and Elsa in Canada talking on the phone. That's correct. Ah, je comprends. I hope this does not cause too much delay. I need to have this item soon so my team and I can incorporate it into our very own French-made acoustic toad hydrophone array. Our customers in Indonesia are using these for underwater exploration. Sounds interesting. I had got some good news. I received a message from our compliance department that your integrated circuit was manufactured in the United States and therefore is subject to the EAR. The Export Control Classification Number or ECCN is 3A001.A.2. 
1.7 and does not require a license to ship to you in France. As Elsa is speaking, a blue text bubble appears with an image of the U.S. Origin Integrated Circuit. The phrases U.S. Origin and Subject to the EAR and ECCN 3A001.A.7 appear next to the integrated circuit. A red message appears at the bottom of the screen that says, Watch Export Controls, a quick start guide to learn how to determine if you have an export license requirement at bis.doc.gov forward slash index dot php forward slash online dash training dash room. You mentioned that the integrated circuit will be incorporated into your French-made hydrophone array that will be sold to buyers in Indonesia. Oui. The item subject to the EAR bubble appears on the screen, and a red arrow points to it was produced in the United States. Since the integrated circuit is of U.S. origin, you will need to determine if your hydrophone array will be subject to the EAR and require a U.S. re-export license to ship from France to Indonesia or any other country around the world. Really? Yes. A non-U.S. made item might be subject to the EAR if the percentage of the controlled U.S. content is above a certain level. Based on fair market value, this is called the de minimis rule. Another red arrow points to it is a non-U.S. made product that contains more than a specified percentage of controlled U.S. origin content. Uh, can you show me an example of this rule, please? That is the extent of my knowledge. It is best that we contact a BIS export counselor to explain the de minimis rule to us. The text bubble disappears. Elsa calls BIS, and an export counselor appears on the screen to the right of Elsa. He is sitting at his desk in Washington, D.C., with a view of the Washington Monument from his window. Hello. Thank you for calling the Bureau of Industry and Security. How can I help you? Hello, my name is Elsa and I'm from Canada. I have Francois from France on the phone and we would like to learn more about the de minimis rule. It's a pleasure meeting both of you. Is there a specific transaction you're working through? Yes, I have a U.S. origin integrated circuit in Canada that will be shipped to Francois in France. Francois plans to incorporate the integrated circuit into a hydrophone array and sell his product to customers in Indonesia. As Elsa is speaking, a screen appears with a map of the world. And a blue text bubble appears that says, The U.S. origin integrated circuit was exported from the United States to Canada. The integrated circuit appears on the screen above the United States. Green arrows point from the United States to Canada and from Canada to France. The integrated circuit follows the green arrows along the map. The text in the blue bubble changes to say, the U.S. origin integrated circuit will be re-exported from Canada to France. A text box pointing to the arrow from the United States to Canada appears that says export. Another text box pointing to the arrow from Canada to France appears that says re-export. The text in the blue bubble changes to say, the U.S. integrated circuit will be incorporated into a hydrophone array and Francois will sell the French-made hydrophone array to a customer in Indonesia. An image of the hydrophone array appears on the screen with a green arrow pointing from the hydrophone array to Indonesia, and a text box pointing to the green arrow appears that says re-export. That sounds interesting. Do you know the export control classification number of the integrated circuit? Yes, my expert compliance department informed me that it is under ECCN 3A001.8.7. A blue text bubble appears with an image of the U.S. origin integrated circuit. The phrases U.S. origin and subject to the EAR and ECCN 3A001.8.7 appear next to the integrated circuit. A screenshot of the Commerce Control List entry for 3A001 appears below the blue text bubble. Well, that's great. Now that we have the ECCN number, the first step is to determine if the integrated circuit is controlled U.S. content to Indonesia. ECCN 3A001.A.7 is controlled for national security column 2 and anti-terrorism column 1 reasons. Using the Commerce Country chart, 
It appears that there is an X in the box for the national security column two reasons to Indonesia. Therefore, the 3A001.A.7 item is a controlled item to Indonesia and will need to be included in your de minimis calculation. As the BIS counselor is speaking, a red box highlights NS applies to entire entry, NS column 2, and AT applies to entire entry, AT column 1, on the reasons for control table of ECCN 3A001. Then the commerce country chart appears with a red box highlighting the row for Indonesia and the columns for NS2 and AT1. A red arrow points to the X at the intersection of Indonesia and NS2 on the commerce country chart. The commerce country chart disappears in a blue text box that says, what if the U.S. origin parts are controlled for anti-terrorism reasons only or are designated EAR-99? What if I have other U.S. origin parts incorporated into my hydrophone array that are controlled for anti-terrorism reasons only or that are EAR-99? Screenshots of the commerce control list entry for ECCN 3A991 and EAR99 appear on the screen. A red message appears at the bottom of the screen that says, Watch Export Controls, a quick start guide to learn how to determine if you have an export license requirement at bis.doc.gov forward slash index dot php forward slash online dash training dash room. That's a great question, Francois. Specifically for Indonesia, items controlled for anti-terrorism reasons, for example, ECCN 3A991 and EAR99 items are not controlled to Indonesia. In other words, based on item and destination, there is no license required to ship items controlled for anti-terrorism reasons only or EAR99 items to Indonesia. This means that you do not include the anti-terrorism controlled item or EAR 99 item in your calculation. The commerce country chart appears on the screen with a red box highlighting the row for Indonesia and the column for AT1. A red arrow points to the empty box at the intersection of Indonesia and AT1 on the commerce country chart. However, if you intend to ship your hydrophone array to a customer in Cuba, you would need to include those items in your calculation because they do require a license to Cuba. When the BIS counselor mentions Cuba, the commerce country chart and the red message disappear, and a screenshot of section 746.2 of Cuba appears on the screen, and the phrase, you will need a license to export or re-export all items subject to the EAR is underlined in red. Well, so my calculation should only include the US origin items that are controlled to the specific country? A blue text bubble appears at the top of the screen that says, for de minimis calculations, only include the U.S. origin items that are controlled to the destination country of the non-U.S. made item. You're a quick study, Francois. That is correct. So how does this de minimis rule work? The de minimis rule is described in section 734.4, and the calculation is detailed in supplement number two to part 734 of the EAR. It considers the fair market value of controlled U.S. content as a percentage of the total value of the end item. A white screen appears with a blue text bubble that says de minimis rule 15 CFR 734.4 and supplement number 2 to 15 CFR 734. And the table of contents of part 734 appears. Red arrows point to 734.4 de minimis U.S. content and supplement number two to part 734, guidelines for de minimis rules. I will show you how to calculate the value for de minimis purposes for both Indonesia and Cuba because the calculation will be different. Let's say that the 3A001.A.7 integrated circuit is valued at $600. You will incorporate U.S. origin cables designated as EAR99 to the hydrophone array as well and the cables have a fair market value of $100. And let's say that the French-made hydrophone array is valued at $6,000. It is important to note that I am using fair market values. 
If you receive a below market price, such as a wholesale price, you must still use the fair market value of the item or a reliable valuation method to calculate or derive the fair market value. A table appears on the screen with column headings for Indonesia and Cuba. The first row heading says ECCN 38001.A.7 Integrated Circuit, and 600 is listed under the column headings for both Indonesia and Cuba. The second row heading says EAR99 Cables, and Not Controlled U.S. Content is listed under Indonesia, and $100 is listed under Cuba. The third row heading is Total Value of Hydrophone Array, and $6,000 is listed under the columns for both Indonesia and Cuba. The last row heading says Percent of U.S. Controlled Content, and 10% is listed under Indonesia, and 11.67% is listed under Cuba. The calculation is the fair market value of the total U.S. controlled content divided by the fair market value of the non-U.S. made item. You will multiply the result by 100 to represent the number as a percentage and then arrive to your final de minimis value. A chalkboard appears on the screen and the de minimis equation appears on the chalkboard as the BIS counselor describes it. As you can see, the level of controlled U.S. content for Indonesia is 10% and the controlled U.S. content for Cuba is 11.67%. The de minimis calculation is erased from the chalkboard, and the specific de minimis calculations for Indonesia and Cuba appear on the screen, showing a result of 10% for Indonesia and 11.67% for Cuba. So now that I've practiced my math, uh, what do these percentages mean? The specific de minimis calculations for Indonesia and Cuba are erased from the chalkboard and a stacked block chart with 0%, less than or equal to 10%, less than or equal to 25%, and above 25% appear on the screen. Text appears on the chalkboard as they are verbalized by the BIS counselor. I'd like you to remember three percentages, 0%, 10%, and 25%. These are the de minimis values for various countries around the world. If the value of the controlled U.S. content is 10% or less of the non-U.S. made item, then the shipment of the non-U.S. made item is not subject to the EAR to anywhere in the world. If the value of controlled U.S. content is 25% or less of the non-U.S. made item, then the shipment of the non-U.S. made item is not subject to the EAR unless the item is shipped to countries designated as terrorist supporting or embargoed countries. BIS lists these countries in country group E1 and E2 in supplement number one to part 740 of the EAR. Currently, Cuba is listed under country group E2 as an embargoed country. If the value of the controlled U.S. content is above 25%, then the non-U.S. made item is subject to the EAR to all destinations. I'll give you a minute to let this sink in. Ah, okay, I believe I understand. When I export my French hydrophone array to Indonesia, the shipment is not subject to the EAR because the controlled U.S. content is 10%. And you said that the shipments of non-U.S. made items with 10% or less controlled U.S. content are not subject to the EAR? You got it. Now, for Cuba, the controlled content is 11.67%. Since Cuba is listed in country group E2, the shipment of the French hydrophone array to Cuba is subject to the EAR because 11.67% is above 10%. Red arrows point to the blocks for less than or equal to 10% and less than or equal to 25% as the BIS counselor explains how to interpret the 10% result for Indonesia and the 11.67% result for Cuba. But you also mentioned 0%. A red arrow points to the block for 0%, and the other two red arrows disappear. You're a sharp one, Francois. There are certain U.S. origin items for which you do not need to calculate the de minimis level, as any U.S. content will make the non-U.S. made item subject to the EAR. This does not apply to your hydrophone array, but if the U.S. content is described in section 734.4a of the EAR, the shipment is subject to the EAR. No math needed. 
A text box appears that says 15 CFR 734.4A describes items for which there is no de minimis level, and the chalkboard disappears. Ah, c'est génial. The, the quality is unlike ours. My friend Claire in Germany does not seem to have these concerns. Her hydrophone array does not have US origin parts and she ships worldwide. The item subject to the EAR bubble appears on the screen again as the BIS counselor speaks. Red arrows point to, it is a non-US made product based on certain US origin technology or software. And it is a non-US made product made by a plant or major component of a plant that is the direct product of certain US origin technology or software. I see. If Claire's hydrophone array is produced based on certain U.S. origin technology or software, or if Claire's hydrophone array is produced by a plant or any major component of a plant that is a direct product of U.S. origin technology or software, then her hydrophone array might be subject to U.S. regulations. A good friend would advise Claire to contact a BIS counselor to assist her in understanding this concept that BIS refers to as the foreign produced direct product rule. We all know you're a good friend, Francois. I will be sure to let you know. Miss excuse, uh, but what happens again if my hydrophone is subject to the EAR again? I know the answer. If your French hydrophone is subject to the EAR, you would need to determine if you need a U.S. expert license to ship your product to your customer. A screenshot of the simplified network application process redesign, Snap R page, appears on the screen, and a red message appears at the bottom of the screen that says, Visit the BIS online training room to learn about the simplified network application process redesign, Snap R web portal, at bis.doc.gov forward slash index.php forward slash online dash training dash room. That is correct, Elsa. If you determined you need a license, you would apply for one from the SnapR web portal. You have been incredibly helpful in explaining U.S. re-export controls. Now that I know all of this great information, I can now stay ahead of my supply chain and expand my international portfolio. Is this all I need to know about U.S. re-export controls? An image of the world briefly appears on the screen and is replaced with a screenshot of the BIS website. A cursor appears on the screen and clicks on various menus on the BIS website as described by the BIS counselor. I would consider this a good start, Francois. Anyone shipping or transshipping an item from one foreign country to another should be aware that certain re-exports are subject to the EAR. The BIS website provides information and resources on re-exports and offshore transactions under the licensing tab and clicking on re-exports and offshore transactions. Additionally, BIS has online training videos that you can watch to learn more about the export administration regulations. Click on new to exporting from the BIS homepage and click on training room to view the online training videos. The BIS website disappears from the screen. Wow, merci BIS. I feel much more comfortable with re-export controls now. You're welcome, Francois. As always, BIS's Office of Exporter Services is here to help. Please feel free to contact us if you have any further questions. Thank you for watching this video, and happy re-exporting. The last scene says, U.S. Department of Commerce Bureau of Industry and Security with website https colon forward slash forward slash BIS Dot doc dot gov. The following phone numbers are on the screen. Washington, D.C. 202-482-4811. Irvine, California 949-660-0144. And Enforcement Hotline 1-800-424-2980. The Department of Commerce logo is at the top left corner and the BIS logo is at the top right corner of the screen.